You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We return today with our third Ewan White offering, The Urbanite, which was published in the January 1950 edition of Weird Tales. The great city is never still, for even when it sleeps under darkness, it stirs unceasingly with nightmare thoughts. See the video description for a link to our Ewan White playlist. We hope you enjoy this one. The Urbanite by Ewan White Two and a half blocks away, the great ships that stood warped to their docks, their bows muzzled inland, were descendants of other things that had floated down through the ages of man's recorded history. Nearer at hand, only a block away, was the grey steel and stone structure of the elevated highway, a refinement ultimately of paths that Neanderthals hacked through bushes and foliage. On the lofty motor terrace that rimmed the waterfront between rows of dark-faced tenements, the auto-machines of today ran, for their vigour and streamlined modernity, thanking the horseless carriages of yesterday, the saris, cycles, and rickshaws of the past. Nearest at hand was an empty lot, different as is a city empty lot from any other such, for it is never empty, having a strange and heterogeneous collection of junk bearing testimony to the mechanical genius of an age that takes so much for granted. Metal parts from the metal monsters that ran by on the network of streets in the elevated highway, fenders and wheels and spark plugs, discarded parts of all sorts, and other things, barrels and barrel staves, bottles and cans, the residue of garbage now surviving its kerosene and flame ordeal with a smouldering, pungent smoke. Sitting in the lot, his back against a discarded packing case, was Happy Charlie, taking the sun here as it filtered down through the soot and smoke haze and mist of the city to brown leather his face, instead of at Bermuda or Marseille or Carmel, because he was just Happy Charlie— a bum. But Charlie, who got his other appellation of happy, possibly because of his long, sad horse's face, was as those others in their flowered trunks on their yachts and their beaches. Just as the ships land-warped in the river nearby, or plying its turgid currents, and the cars that whooshed by on the elevated highway itself belonged to other, earlier things. He was the same as those flowered, panted, over-rich— though they would have laughed largely at this. But go back, sceptics. Go back only a few hundreds of thousands of years to the wetness and warmth of the then, to the shallow lagoons and pools along the coasts of first-formed seas, to the slime and the sub-life that slowly came from that slime, that became jelly wherever there was a little pool or a tide or a shallow sea, and on to the vertebrates, Happy Charlie was no different, for he had come from the same beginnings. That his chronically whiskey breath was tolerated around the place next door, where it said with big orange letters, peeling now from the weather, steaks and chops, wines and liquors, because he ran occasional errands for Mr. Ross Telly, who ran the restaurant, made him basically no different from the biggest, toughest trucker who thumped his ham hand on the counter for quick service or the boss of the truckers, or the owner of the whole chain who was worth a million, and might, or could if he wanted to, sail his own yacht on the river that sent its damp, dank smells up these narrow cobblestone streets to mix with the odours of inland machines and the people who worked them and lived by them in a great concentrate known as a city. Happy Charlie, in his most sober moment, never concerned himself with his origins. He was neither interested in biogenesis, nor would recognize the word if he came upon it written, instead of the rightful trade name, 
on a can of his favorite beer, that the living matter of which he was such an insignificant molecular but present-day offshoot had been originally brought to the earth from some other planet by meteorites, or was an emergent from a complex of physical-chemical processes, was one of several such worries he had never had. There, Rostelli was calling him. Happy Charlie reluctantly lurched to his feet, muttering under his breath. The sun had lulled him back to a happier day when he'd been a railbird at local trotteries, with an occasional winner keeping him away from the ignominy of honest work. But these errands kept him in sustenance, in Hamburg and Spud, and, best of all, in beer or something stronger. As Charlie rambled towards the door and went under the neon bars that advertised Rostelli's restaurant, quick service, there was nothing about him to suggest that he was the refinement of countless centuries of growth, starting with the amoeba and the one-celled animal of the Precambrian era. Heat lay across the city, keeping haze and soot and smell down, fresh air and breeze out, like a wool buffer. The machines that ran the city were overheated and grew balky. People brawled and cursed, and were tired by their own anger. Their sweat seared them, and mingled with the filth that lay across windows and window ledges, tables and walls and floors. Cars and trains surged and rumbled in and out on the street arteries that led here and there. People walked the boiling streets and didn't need the every-season's newspaper gimmick of the reporter frying an egg on the downtown sidewalk, for the fire of the pavement could be felt through the thickest shoe leather. But there was no end to it. The lifts went up and the lifts came down, elevator boys and bus drivers and subway trainmen were replaced, but their machines kept moving, and the people themselves— the last one at any hour of day or night never disappeared around the corner. There was always another person, another train, another car, and the gaseous, acrid effluvium mixed and settled on dry throats and streets and empty lots and huge hotels alike. Happy Charlie ran his errand at a slow snail's pace, returned to Rostelli's, and had a cold beer leaning against the extra-strong bar— that the proprietor had had built in, because these truckers are big, strong guys. They got big, heavy feet and arms. By and by, Happy Charlie took himself out back to the empty lot again. They had long ago stopped wondering about him. Where other people avoided the terrible scorch and burn of the afternoon heat, Charlie's old, bent frame soaked it up, and his face and wrinkled arms, bared to the elbow, grew browner and browner, like well-used saddle leather. Occasionally he would poke through the junkyard with a stick, worrying the metal parts that collected there, salvaging a piece here and there, and occasionally selling it for a few pennies. Most of the time, though, Happy Charlie just sat, his bloodshot whiskey eyes half shut, his mouth open a bit, perhaps to breathe better the stale second-hand air that lived poorly over the city, exhaled by a million motors, by a million human lungs. As noted, Happy Charlie's mind, sober or otherwise, mainly otherwise, was not concerned with the vitalistic or mechanistic theories of human origin, including his own. But through a state of almost chronic alcoholic befuddlement, don't they say liquor too much and too long does something to the brain? Happy Charlie did think of old days in his own life. It took him occasionally, and was a laugh-provoking thought, but when he'd been younger, much younger, bah, just a kid, he'd had a chance to go to a camp sponsored by some charitable group. As an indigent, even then, he'd qualified, quite despite himself, and was on the verge of being sent to some wooded, faraway spot where, as the uplifted counsellors for the project described in glowing terms, birds sang and brooks babbled, and God's good clean earth set everything at rights. It had been a close call, but Happy Charlie had beaten the rap. To be sure, it took some explaining at the neighbourhood settlement house. A fat woman there had argued with the then youngster Happy Charlie— 
but at the end she had shaken her head, and he had won. Well, if you don't want to go, there are plenty of others who'll be glad to take your place, she had sighed. You don't know what you're missing, young man. But then advanced courses in psychology and something or other had prompted her to say importantly and to impress him, for there was no one else. I guess you're just one of those chronic urbanites. And then talking down to him condescendingly, as she dismissed him at one and the same time, one of those who comes from the city and just likes to live in the city. The word urbanite was a big new thing, and she had called him it. The word drove Happy Charlie for his first and last time into the public library. He had looked it up. It was probably the biggest, most unusual word he knew, but he'd never forgotten it. That's what he was, an urbanite, one who is a product of, who lives in, who likes to live in a city. It made laughter to himself often to think of this, and Happy Charlie's open mouth formed a smile even now back in the lot, and the cars on the elevated highway a block away did the laughing for him, with their whoosh and scream of tyres on the hot cobblestones, whispering, grinding, and screeching that they, like him, belonged here in this place of built-up steel and concrete and cement, with black fronts for the poor and marble fronts for the rich, and brownstone anywhere where age still stood, and the bright young college train surveyors had not yet ripped out with their plumb lines and maps to build newer things higher. What do you know? There'd been a car hopped the highway just here not too long ago, landed right in this empty lot whose far end dwelled forever in shadow under the extended apron of the elevated highway. Damn Otto jumped right over the wall, it did, and landed down there with its three broken people all screaming, and their dreadful harmony made into a quartet by the soon siren of the ambulance, coming to see what could be done after such a dreadful mistake. Happy Charlie, from his siesta spot at this end of the lot, had been first over to the smashed, overturned car at the other end. He'd been there before the faces appeared on the express highway, others who'd stopped and looked over. Well, well, those things happen. It's the way of life. And Happy Charlie had considerable of the philosopher in him, though he might be unaware of it. It was a nice job of demolishing automobile, and the noise of the people who'd misled their auto soon died away— as they were hauled and hoisted and lifted out of the wreckage into the white-sided, almost clean-looking ambulance. Left behind was a car there was no use hauling away and fixing up. Nights since then, people plucked at it, and they took tires and any parts they could take away. Maybe insurance folks came. Happy Charlie didn't know. He lost track with errands for Rostelli, and drinks of beer and whiskey. The twisted frame was left, and what remained recognizable of the broken car body. A little more glass sprinkled around the half-earth, rocks and junk heaps of the yard made no difference. It was hardly noticeable. Happy Charlie's reveries were broken into by the harsh voice of Rostelli. Again? Another errand? He got up, slower this time, stretching his sun-stiffened frame out. His way of life— had caused him to forswear many of the emotions. But deep inside, if you dug beneath the leathery skin and the old sinews, the roomy bones, there was a hate smouldering for Rostelli that came from fear. He felt the same way about some of the truckers. Rostelli used him and paid little for it, knowing he owned this derelict by means of occasional meals and much more than occasional drinks, without which Happy Charlie could not survive, and for which he would do the interminable odd jobs and run the errands that a wise-faced, sharp-minded high schooler would charge the restaurant proprietor a fat something to do. But for Ostelli and some of the other truckers, there was one giant man in particular, had a contempt for Happy Charlie they were free to express— when the opportunity presented itself. Happy Charlie knew it intuitively, as that superiority that otherwise inferior people feel for subordinates. Happy Charlie was an old bum, 
He was an old drunk, no good sot, a vag, a bum, and other assorted and pungent terms of the waterfront, of a low-life restaurant, of the trucking world, of circles where strong, explosive men move, and, with the hint of their own limitations, take that fleeting knowledge out on the nearest weak thing. Rostelli, who'd had a hard day and suffered from the heat, sent him off with a cuff, and a trucker, who'd wandered in to spend a few hours before taking off on his night run, roared with laughter and threw a potato chip at old Happy Charlie, as he lurched off on his ordered quest. Happy Charlie made better time than usual, but was greeted only with Rostelli's bad temper and another sneer from the big trucker. Old Charlie's request for another beer got him shoved out the door of the restaurant. Oh, well— and he settled himself in the sun again. Times were good, times were bad. That was the way things seemed to go. To him it mattered not. In moments like these came feelings of delicious superiority. Rostelli worried about business slowing up. Not so many of the longshoremen, the truckers, the labourers came in, and not so early did they come, and not so long did they stay— nor so much money did they spend as once upon a time, and the boisterous, cursing thick and muscle-armed men themselves with their shouting and noise-making. They had their own worries locked up, too. Did you hear? Ace Company laid off fifteen last week. Here there's gonna be more. And so on. Maybe they'd get to realize his way was the best, and Happy Charlie settled himself contentedly on the other side of a pile of debris, chuckling at his own thoughts of himself, <laughs> pleased at his smartness, and after looking furtively this way and that, reaching into the piles to fetch out a bottle, warm to be sure, even in its shadowed hiding-place, dust and plaster and dirt covered, but inside when it was uncorked, the liquid was wonderful— he ahed and smacked his lips as the last two inches of the bottle burned down his throat and hit his stomach with that impact that raw whiskey always has. He settled himself lazily in the sun. It was still stronger and hotter than ever, even now in the late afternoon. They'd have to call louder to make him hear them here. Rostelli and that big trucker could bump their heads together for all he cared. The warmth from within and the heat from without met. His eyelids were at half-mast, and his body felt luxurious resting in the fold of a rusted fender, with his head against a barrel's back. The pile ahead, directly ahead, there was what was left of the car that had jumped a week ago. Imagine a car jumping like people do. The heat sent shimmers of itself from the ground upward, when new waves of burning hotness came down from the airless heavens. The shimmering gave to the junk pile a strange appearance, as though it moved, as though the steel frame at its core was in slight motion, like railroad tracks in the distance on a scorching day. Happy Charlie stood comfortably in his cocoon of splendid warmth. As his eyelids sank lower, his mouth opened more— and the scene took on the early visitations of dream-provoked unreality. But he was not sleeping, did not intend to, for it was too good to feel the heat and hear the sound of the cars whooshing by, occasional noise from the river as one of the great liners whistled so that none would be unaware of its great bulk and importance. A tenement radio blared blastingly before being turned down. The words were, Heat spell, temperature setting record, and happy Charlie lay there lolling, enjoying every moment of it. The not empty lot and its junk made his home. He felt familiar here, secure. There was no reason to think or be aware of anything else. But as happy Charlie lay there, and as Rostelli and the big trucker griped to each other back in the dark coolness of the restaurant, an epoch was being marked here near the river wharves and the elevated highway in the heart of the great city. It was as with those long-ago small pools and lagoons, the rain-filled trenches and swamp places. But then there was no one to know, 
but only hundreds upon hundreds of centuries later, the eye to look backward and reconstruct. Or, if there had been life preceding life and a brain, would it have been cognizant of what was happening any more than was happy Charlie, now filled with his whiskey in the heat of the day, lying with his arms and fingers against orange rind and discarded paper parcels and dirt and wood and nails and the overflow of civilization which must always find its way to places like these? Charlie saw, but he did not believe. He did not believe because he could not know, nor could any great scholar in fancy clothes and with fancy language know. For it was at this extraordinary and so right moment, just now, for all this to change from nothingness to somethingness. The particles of the city raped air, the particles from blast furnaces, the shavings from steel and iron, chips from concrete and macadam, chunks of tar and the smell from these, exhaust from all the machines, the molecules of structural things, millions upon millions of them all together, and the people, numbers beyond counting, breathing in and out, the already effluvious mass, warming with their grime-coated noses and throats and lungs, warming and nurturing and expelling for another to breathe in. And here, all here, concentrated under the sky in this heat, recipient, the pile at the far end of the lot. Moving, happy Charlie. Moving. Not heat shimmers, but moving. The steel gathering to itself other qualities. The scrap, the exudate of countless eons of human progress. Charlie saw these things in motion. He saw them moving, gathering themselves with a sinuous purposefulness. But he did not believe. Being a human, he could not believe. In his ear at last was the far away but shrill sound of Rostelli calling him. The bellow grew louder and louder. He bestirred himself automatically, even as his mind tried to cope with this new thing, as he rose to his feet to walk back to the restaurant in obedience. The full, terrible, and fatal weight of what he saw now came upon him, cutting the heat and whiskey-induced fogginess from his brain as a scalpel cuts flesh. And for a fleeting second, happy Charlie, with all his humbleness of intellect, knew a moment of sheer terror, unsurpassed by any man for thousands of years. Rostelli drummed on the counter. He was alone in his restaurant with the big trucker. They had been deploring the times, keeping civility between each other by directing their bitterness and hatred towards a common cause. Now it was happy Charlie. "'Where's that drunken bum?' Rostelli snarled and went to the window again to holler out of it. The trucker, from the depths of his peanut brain, thumped his great hands against fat thighs and said, You gotta treat one of him like a kid. You treat him good, they treat you bad. Gotta show him who's boss. Rostelli shook his head angrily. By God, I will. Get my hands on his old skinny neck. I'll twist his head off. The trucker roared with laughter. He was well along on beers now. They had inflamed his head with delicious thoughts of violence. Rostelli bellowed out the window again, and then finally, finally, after a long wait, the trucker cocked his head. Here's someone coming. Guess you finally woke up that deadbeat, Rostelli. It had been a poor day, and there was no money in the till. The proprietor's hands gripped and ungripped with the desire to take his wrath out on something tangible. The cheap wire netting door of the restaurant slammed open. And I've told him not to bang that door that away, Rostelli muttered under his breath. They looked towards the entrance, past the four or five tables set around the room, the booths at one side, the fire engine red jukebox, and they waited in the semi-darkness for Happy Charlie. But it was not Happy Charlie. The trucker's eyes narrowed, and Rostelli blinked. There was for both of them no more words, and a countable number of breaths, for he, you say he, oh, so loosely, was not of their experience or ken. The limbs were iron and steel, 
but not as in the figure of speech. The thighs and legs were of metal, of cement. The trunk was something else. There was no man here. In fact, only a thing. But men must describe everything else through their own eyes. It must either be a man, an animal, and inanimate objects don't move. This incredible birth had taken place this late afternoon. From the dirt eddies, from the dust lying thick across the metropolis, from the impregnated air, the noise, the endless vibrations, from all these this obscene thing had come. Out of the hate from the man-curses, dying in mid-air, conceived by the hate and wicked yearnings, born of the sperm of the city, of the thoughts and people and machines too close-packed here, this new life, this urbanite, had come. The trucker rose from his place by the bar, his eyes opened wider than they had for twenty years, his great hands held wide as though to shape a question mark to help his brain and eyes realize they saw and knew it couldn't be. The face of the thing? There was no face. Instead, a brickish structure. But men have to see faces, or make them up in things that move. Even animals have faces. The trucker had a moment, and then he was spread-eagled against the extra-strong bar which had been built for the likes of him spread-eagled and then squashed by the intruder in a methodical way with one, two, three, four piston-like sweeps of a steel and cement thing, where arms grow on men. Rostelli thought of a prayer word, but never got it out. He too was caught in the corner of the room, noting with a supreme irrelevance before his own doom fell upon him, that in the other massive piston-like appendage, the thing held an arm clenched in chrome and aluminum fingers, an arm unmistakable because of its brown, leathery skin drawn tightly over skinny bones. And then Rostelli died as the trucker had died, and Happy Charlie before them, by the hand, and of course the concrete and steel thing was not a hand, of one who'd grown from the very things that men build and command in cities— the machines and the metals mixed with the exhaust that comes from hate and hope and hurry, all put together just right, precisely, this one day in all of history to create something, not of this millennium, but of the next. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.